The first three races of the year are over, but the question is, what did we learn from those first three races? Well, that is what we're going to be looking at and trying to find out today. Bahrain, Saudi Arabia and Australia all had interesting factors and we're going to be looking at those and using the data to analyse what happened to see if there's anything that we can use to learn for potentially predicting the future. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more F1 content. Well, what's the first thing that we learned? Well, the first thing we've learned is that there is no consistent back marker this season. Typically in Formula 1, there is always one or two teams destined for last place. Last year, it was Nicholas Latifi. In 2021, it was Haas. Before then, you had Williams, and then going further back, teams like HRT, Minardi, and Arrows were all well-known backmarkers. But this year, that has not been the case so far. In each race, we've seen pretty much a different team occupy the back of the grid. In Bahrain, McLaren were just not ready for this Grand Prix. They were shocking in the race, with Piastri breaking down early on, and Norris doing the ultra-rare five-stop strategy. But, that being said, when they were running, they were pumping faster laps fairly consistently than Haas, as this graph shows, between Norris, Hulkenberg and Magnussen. In Saudi Arabia, McLaren had a great qualifying, which could be seen by the fact that Piastri made it all the way to Q3. But in the race, though, McLaren were dreadful. Their race was heavily compromised on the very first lap of the race, and due to how slow they were in a straight line, which we can see by this graph from their qualifying performance, they could not overtake anyone. But in terms of race pace, they were not actually the slowest car, as that honour belonged to Logan Sargent in the Williams. And finally, in Australia, McLaren all of a sudden became okay with them going from zero points and dead last to fifth in the Constructors' Championship, and the slowest team in that race was Alfa Romeo. In qualifying, Bottas was last and Joe was only 17th, and the race was not any better for them either, as this graph shows when we look at Joe, Norris and Hulkenberg. It will be interesting to see which team will be the next to occupy the back of the rear end of the field as we move on to Baku. Was Australia a one-off for Alfa Romeo, or is there an issue that could plague them going forward? We don't really know that yet, but there is one big issue right now for their rivals McLaren, and that is McLaren are massively lacking straight line speed, which will hurt them with the enormous running to turn one. But they are expecting upgrades, which hopefully could improve their straight line speed performance. Not only is there no real backmarker team this year, but we've also learned that the midfield fight is incredibly tight, which goes hand in hand with the fact that there's no backmarker teams this season. With the midfield being tighter than ever, we have been blessed by some brilliant midfield battles already this year. Arguably, it could be said that, based on Saudi Arabia and most of Australia, Alpine is probably the best midfield team, and could be, as the season goes on, that they manage to distance themselves from the rest of the mid-pack. But there is of course one thing that's probably going to hold them back, and that is the French civil war between Gasly and Ocon. But pace-wise, they have been very strong. However, they have benefited from the smoother surfaces of Saudi Arabia and Australia. Baku could be interesting for the midfield, and why is this? Well, Bahrain was a very bumpy surface, and with this bumpy surface, we saw the Alpine struggle a little bit more than the likes of Alfa Romeo, Alfa Tauri and Williams, as they were actually fairly strong over the bumps. And Baku, especially if we got off of last year, is one of the bumpiest surfaces all year, which of course we saw when the Mercedes almost broke Lewis Hamilton's spine. So, with that in mind, could we see Alpine have a little bit more of a difficult weekend in Baku? Well, based on Bahrain, possibly yes. However, there is a good chance that the car has massively improved since then. Hopefully then, the midfield fight can continue to be this close and exciting. We also learned that the fight for second between Mercedes, Aston Martin and Ferrari is 
also incredibly tight, despite the fact that the three teams are running completely different aerodynamic concepts, at least for now anyway. The three teams have been very close in multiple races, and even though overall Aston Martin, at least with Fernando Alonso, has managed a podium in all three races, the story is not actually that clear. Ferrari has been very unlucky in the early stages of the season. In fact, for Ferrari, this is their worst start to an F1 season since 2009. Yep, you heard that right. It is even worse than 2020. In 2020, they scored 27 points in the first three races, but in 2023, they have only managed 26 points right now. But for them, the data doesn't exactly show them being that slow. In Bahrain, arguably they were the second fastest car, especially with Charles Leclerc. He was very much on track for a podium before Ferrari did its usual party trick and blew up. In Saudi Arabia, Leclerc was lightning fast on those soft tyres. In fact, if you look at the telemetry between Russell, Alonso and Leclerc, and whilst it's somewhat hard to tell the difference because of course Leclerc was coming through the field, but when Leclerc finally got into clear air before he boxed, you could see he managed to go faster than Russell and was still able to find time. I still believe that in that race, Ferrari kind of missed a trick by putting Leclerc on hards instead of putting him on the mediums. And finally in Australia, Carlos Sainz was, in terms of pace, one of the fastest drivers in the field. For Sainz, he was caught out by the first red flag which came out after Albon dropped it. This red flag essentially demoted Sainz to P11 and he had to fight his way through the field, which he did. Of course, unfortunately for Sainz, he made a bit of a silly lunge at the second red flag restart and Leclerc binned it on the first lap, leaving Ferrari with scoring zero points in Australia. One good thing for Ferrari is they have great straight line efficiency, which should really help them in Baku. However, one question mark is their tyre wear and, well, they were okay in Australia, but of course Australia had virtually zero tyre wear. Not only this, reliability is a massive question mark for the Ferrari team. Can they get on top of this? It's going to be hard to tell. For Mercedes, it seemed like they had gone backwards after Bahrain and that they were going to be in for a world of hurt. They were not great on their tyre wear in Bahrain, as this graph shows, and it is hard to say if they've gotten on top of that yet. Saudi Arabia and Australia have been historically low tyre wear circuits, and we saw that this year as well. This allowed Mercedes to unlock a little bit of extra pace in their car, especially when you also factor in the fact that they have very smooth surfaces, which we saw also last year. But when the surface was bumpy, Mercedes struggled, which is of course how it was in Bahrain. With Baku's bumps, it will be interesting to see if they can fix any of their issues or if they've got on top of what was causing their issues previously. I'm sure there's a lot of upgrades to come their way, and Baku is another low tyre wear circuit, which should help them out a little bit. But their car still doesn't look great over the bumps, of course, at least not right now. This graph here, though, does show how good the Mercedes can be when the surface is flat, as we compare the pace of Carlos Sainz, Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton from Australia. And from this, it is clear to see that Mercedes and Aston Martin have very close pace, as both Alonso and Hamilton were trading fastest laps between the pair of them. And speaking of Aston Martin, Aston Martin have had the dream start to the year. For them, their car is excellent in so many areas. In terms of downforce, they probably produce a little bit more downforce than the Ferrari and also the Mercedes, which, given where they were this time last season, is incredible. Not only is the car a downforce monster, it is also a monster on the brakes as we've seen in Bahrain and also in Saudi Arabia where Alonso was one of the fastest cars on the brakes because whenever it got to a heavy braking zone, Alonso became the fastest car out on circuit. Not only this, it's also very kind on its tyres. The only race where tyre wear has been harsh this year is Bahrain and in Bahrain we saw that on soft tyres Alonso was able to make them last, and whilst he started off slower than his rivals, the better tyre wear meant that Alonso was able to reel in George Russell in the Mercedes, and then when on the hard tyres, 
we saw just how strong the Aston Martin was when they became the second fastest car overall on the hard tyres, as this graph shows. In Saudi, there was a little bit of tyre wear, and we could see that when Mercedes were maybe slightly struggling to keep up with Alonso, potentially due to tyre wear, Alonso was able to push for that 5 second gap. However, it's not all sunshine and roses for Aston Martin. Yes, they have brilliant downforce. Yes, they're great on the brakes. And yes, tyre wear is in their favour. But as this telemetry data shows from qualifying, they have poor straight line speed. And this straight line speed is their downfall. Not only are they draggy, but when using DRS, they don't gain as much time as their rivals do either due to having a less efficient system. And this is going to hold them back going forward, and this is where Aston need to improve, especially if they are to take the fight to Red Bull. So, what's the final thing that we learned? Well, let's talk about Red Bull. And for them, they are by far the fastest car out on track, and Red Bull has had a simply lovely start to the season, as Max Verstappen would probably say. They've won all three races and it does not look like anyone is even remotely close to challenging them. In terms of downforce, their car clearly produces a boatload of it. And unlike the Aston Martin, they have brilliant straight line speed. Red Bull is not only one of the fastest cars in the corner, they are also the fastest car in a straight line most of the time, especially when they use DRS. Their DRS system is the most efficient in the field, meaning that they dump even more drag than their rivals. Not only this, but the Red Bull seems to be very gentle on its tyres, and how can we tell this? Well, let's look back to Bahrain once again, and Max Verstappen was the only driver in the field to do a soft, soft, hard strategy, whereas everyone else had to do a soft, hard, hard strategy. This tells me that Red Bull is also very, very kind on its tyres. Red Bull may have a development penalty, but with the edge that they have currently, it looks very unlikely that anyone will be able to fight Red Bull for the championship this year. As this data shows, Red Bull are just faster pretty much everywhere when compared to their rivals. Going forward, it's kind of scary to think what they could come up with next. The biggest thing though affecting Red Bull is the reliability of the car, and it seems this could be the only thing that stops them from winning a Grand Prix this year. So what is it that we've actually learned from the first three races? Well, what we've learned is there's no real backmarker team so far, which is excellent to see because that means that the field is all closing up. And this means that the midfield fight is closer than ever. And we have seen some brilliant fights in the midfield and that is gonna probably continue as the season goes on. We've also learned that the fight for the second fastest team is also brilliantly close between Aston Martin, Mercedes and Ferrari. But sadly, there is a bit of a gap between the fastest car in the field and that is the only gap that really needs to come down as Red Bull are absolutely dominant so far. They're fast in a straight line, they're fast through the corners and they're kind on tyre wear. But the final thing that we've learned is reliability is a big factor for every single team. We've seen a lot of teams struggling for reliability and this is going to be something that goes forward as the season continues. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this little video and if you have, as always, comment, leave a like and subscribe for more F1 content. Thank you all so much for watching.